Well, I'm going to miss that because we're wrapping up this series. I'm going to really miss that intro video. I feel like I'm about to come up to bat for the major leagues right there. That's my, that's my song. Swinging a bit <laughs> on, on many of my jokes. That's how that happens right there. So it's good to see you. Welcome to Rock Hills, everybody. I want to welcome everybody watching online. Hey, this past week, everybody that's in person and, and maybe in our video venue next door, thanks for being here. I just want you to know, uh, we talked about in our team that we have several people that are deployed, that one of our soldiers, our servicemen and women, and they're watching. And so we don't just say that. It's really happening. People from all over watching. And, and if that's you, we love you. And uh, we are so grateful for what you do. Thanks for joining us. And then whoever you are, wherever you are, thanks for tuning in today. So everybody in, purpose, in person, like you've never done this before, okay? Just hold on a second. Just act like you've never done this before. Would you give it up for those watching online today? <laughs> Woo! That was really kind of dumb because they can still hear me even though they can't see me. So it's good to see everybody. And, uh, man, we've been in a series called The Time Is Now. Has this been helpful to anyone out there that's been here? Good. About seven of us. Great. That's good. That's good. And, uh, man, it's been helpful to me, and, and I really hope it's been helpful to you. If you've not been on the journey with us the past couple of weeks, we're going to wrap it up today. Uh, the time is now. We've been looking at the Old Testament prophet. The minor prophet didn't make it to the majors. He's the minor prophet of Haggai or Haggai. And uh, man, this story, though very old and ancient, I think is profound. Only two chapters in the Old Testament, but profound book that has, I believe, timeless truth that transcends to our timely methods. In, in other words, I really believe that what God speaks to his people through the prophet of Haggai or opportunities that the Holy Spirit speaking to us, speaking to our individual hearts, speaking to us as, as a, a family, speaking to us as a church, as a community, and I really believe that. And so, so, uh, so thanks for being on the ride with us as we, as we wrap this up today. I'm very, very excited about it. I think with all my heart today will be, as hopefully every week is, just practically helpful, practically helpful to us all. What I know is helpful for me is not just hearing God's truth or not only reading God's truth, although that's powerful to read it and hear it, but is when I apply it. And you know that if you read Scripture, you'll find out that the Holy Spirit wants to help you. Holy Spirit wants to help you take His truth and appropriate it. But how that happens is when we say, God, I'm going to start to apply and carry out your word. That's when the strength of the help of the Holy Spirit begins us to, to help us do that. So what we do when we gather is extremely important when we get together in corporate worship and hear God's word and we gather together and our kids are doing that, by the way, students doing that today, and uh, it's awesome. But y'all, what we do when we scatter is just as important and sometimes even more than what we do when we gather. And I'll tell you who it's important for. You say, well, how is that more important? For those who aren't here yet. Those who aren't here yet might be here because of you. And because of you allowing God's word to be in your heart, same is true of me. So we're going to go on a journey today as we wrap up this series, excited to do that in Haggai. And, and, uh, and so I want to start by, by saying this. So um, my family, my wife Lacey, and my, I have two girls, Jovi and Jade, and, and, and we've done something the last several years that we've kind of made a family tradition, so to speak, with uh, our in-laws. And, uh, and we go to Walter's Farm. Anybody ever been to Walter's Farm, a little pumpkin patch? If you haven't and you like pumpkin patches, uh, I would highly recommend it. As far as pumpkin patches go, I will say that it's one of the best, I think. They've done such a good job. Very, very creative. They have all kinds of opportunities uh, there for, for kids. It's just fun. I'm not giving them a commercial. I'm just telling you how it is. It's really awesome on what they've done. And, and so we've gone the last few years. And one of the things that they have there at the Walters Farm is a corn maze. Anybody in here ever done a corn maze? Anybody watching online? Corn maze. Some of you maybe love corn mazes. Good for you. I don't. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one of the things that annoys me the most is a corn maze. Walking into something where I'm going to feel more dumb about myself because I'm wandering around taking wrong turns and running into dead ends. I don't see that as, woo this is fun, right? I see that as annoying and, and sometimes a waste of time. And so, so we've gone, <laughs> I got an amen out of that. Okay? So, so we've gone the past several years and it's an awesome place. Went to the corn maze and I'll tell you what, man, they, they, it, it, they do it right. And so they, they have a whole pattern of a picture that they cut out. And, uh, and so we went uh, a while back, I think last year or the year before, 
And uh, as we did the corn maze, we did what I just said. I mean, we walked around, went into dead ends and trying to find our way, trying to figure it out. I just got frustrated. I just start walking through, the, not the path, just walking through like the corn. I just walk through the corn, like fill the dreams. I come out on the other side, right? I'm like, I'm out. I'm done. And uh, so, so we, we go through it. We get out. We run into some people that uh, Lacey, my wife's family, knew. And, uh, and, and so this guy said, hey, I took a drone shot. So somehow he got a drone shot of the whole picture, like, you know, from an elevated view where you can see the end from the beginning. And I was like, dude, send me that picture because if we ever do this again, I'm going to use that. Bummer is, I think they change up the pattern every year. So that was frustrating. But I got a picture of it. And so he sent a picture. So this is their corn maze, right? So when you're in it, wondering why am I in it, this is what you're in. You know what I mean? Like, wouldn't it be helpful wouldn't it be helpful to have a guide through the maze of life? Wouldn't it be so helpful to have somebody who can say, hey, 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 don't go that way. That's going to be a waste of time. It's going to be a waste of energy. It would be great to have a guide through the maze of life. Someone who can see the end from the beginning. Well, I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? And, and so we got out of there, and he told me he had a picture. I was like, where were you before I got in there? You know what I mean? Like, that would have been so great. And, and what we're going to talk about as we wrap up this series we've been in on Haggai, the time is now, uh, we're going to look at, do y'all, we have a guide. We have a guide who sees the end from the beginning. We have a guide, according to Scripture, that knows where we are. And, and here's the thing, it's not only about navigating and never making wrong turns, what it's even more about is that there's a guide who loves you so much, he just wants to go the, in the journey with you. He just wants, wants to walk through the maze of life with you. And sure, that guide, God, can navigate you. He can help you find a way for a new day and get you out of challenging circumstances. But his heart is that you would just want to be with him. And he wants to walk with you. And I don't know where you are today in your spiritual journey, but today is going to be a great opportunity for everybody in here. I mean, from our youngest students to our most seasoned saints. That's, what, that's a good term that we, we call everyone, everyone in between. Today will be a good opportunity just to take an assessment of where am I on the spiritual journey. Because God loves us so much, he wants to go on that journey with us. And, uh, and he is a guide who, yes, sees the end from the beginning. But, man, he just wants to walk with you. And, and so I'm excited to, to talk about this story as we wrap up. And, uh, and so as we do, I want to I just have that in mind. I want to have that picture. I, wanna have, I call it 30,000-foot view, right? And so we get an opportunity to see kind of a 30,000-foot view on the story of how God interacted with his people through the prophet Haggai. And I don't know about you, but... But what's helpful to me is to look at somebody else's story and learn from it so that I don't make the same mistakes. But I don't know about you. I've also been what I call a slow learner sometimes. And anybody in here like me that you would say, I'm a bit stubborn. I tend to be a little bit of a slow learner. Well, I got good news for you. Let's look at the mistakes of some other people today and feel better about ourselves. All right. So. So that's what we learned from the story of Haggai. What we're also going to see, as we talked about the last couple weeks, is the heart of a loving God for his people. A heart of a loving God for his people and how he doesn't want to punish them, but how he loves them so much, he wants to help restore them. He doesn't want them to walk aimlessly in a maze of life and continue to take wrong turns and hit dead ends and be frustrated. He wants to be a guide for them and help them to know that most importantly, above all, that he's with them. And, and so um, all of us in here at some point in life or another, uh, you take a physical exam. Highly recommend that to do that on an annual basis, right? Like a, it's good to do a health physical checkup. We, I don't know of anybody here who said, no, bad. You know, like I think that all of us would say, you know, what, that's probably a good idea every now and then to do a little physical checkup. Uh, sometimes most of it for me would be a checkup from the neck up. You know, I got, I got some, some things I need to really make sure, pay attention to, symptoms. Sometimes it happen up here, but I'm telling you, from the feet up, it is good physically. We all would say that to do a checkup, a physical exam. Why? Because an, an exam is a lot easier and cheaper than major surgery. And so this story, what I love about this story 
is it literally is a physical example of a group of people that are God's people as God speaks to them that you and I can look at and see a physical representation and for you and I to do a spiritual exam, a spiritual checkup. It's better to do a spiritual checkup now than it would be down the road. And I don't know what it is for you, but when I talk about the maze of life, that can sometimes be confusing and frustrating. Maybe for you, that's your health. Maybe you feel like you're in a maze with your health. Some of you, maybe that's your finances. I I feel like I'm in a corn maze just wandering around, wondering how long am I going to be in here (laughs) until I get out of here. Some of you may be in a relationship or your marriages or your career, whatever it is, we can sometimes get stuck in what we feel like is a maze. And you all got good news today. We have a guide who would love nothing more for us to do a spiritual checkup today. And, and so as we look at this story, that's really what, what we're going to see. So, so I've talked about the last couple of weeks. If you're new today, uh, let me just bring you up to speed as quick as I possibly uh, can because the context of every biblical story you ever read or look at, the context is so important. You got to know what was going on there and then so we can apply it here and now. And so as we look at that story, what was going on, uh, you'll, you'll see that for 50 years, God's people, the Israelites, were exiles. They were conquered by the nation of Babylonia uh, uh, because they had turned their hearts away from God and began to worship idols. And so God allowed a series of events. One of those was that the nation of Babylonia came in and conquered the Israelites. And when they did, they tore down the temple, which housed the presence of God. That was really the focal point of the identity of God's people. And so now they're captives to Babylonia, they're exiles. So so a period of really 70 years from the point of the temple being torn down, 50 years go by, five decades. They're exiles, they can't even worship, they don't even have the the central piece of their identity. And then a a turn of events, Persia comes in and conquers Babylonia. The the Persian king allows a, a remnant of God's people to go back and build the city. And biblical scholars tell us about 50,000 go back to the city to rebuild. They're so excited. It's been five decades of being captives. They're like, woo, we can now build the temple that housed, that will house the presence of God. And so they get started on God's work. They get started on God's work, and they go just a little bit, and then they face opposition. The Samaritans come, and they attack them. And so when they face opposition, even though it had been 50 years, they say the time is not now because it got hard. So they face opposition, and they say, well, apparently now is not the time, because if now was the time, man, we'd have the wind in, the, in our backs. We'd have the wind in our sails. God would be blessing us. But since it got hard, now must not be the time. And so for 16 years, they had built, started the foundation, and then they left it there. So that brings us up to speed on where Haggai comes into the picture. So 16 years, they got started. They were all excited to do God's work. Build a temple which housed the presence of the Lord, faced opposition, and then they quit because it got hard. But you know what? In that period of 16 years, it wasn't always just because it was hard. What happened was it started as hard, made them say, now's not the time, and then turned into apathy. Then it turned into, you know what? I tried it. I mean, I gave it a shot. It got hard. Now I got to focus on me. I got to take care of myself because apparently God isn't helping me. Now it's about self-preservation, and they got apathetic to the things of God. And you all, I really, I really believe that, that God laid Haggai on my heart to speak to us as individuals, but also as a church. Um, I've studied Haggai several times, but, but in Rock Hills, I've never preached it. And I was like, Haggai, I mean, Old Testament, it's a lot to explain. I mean, it's so long ago. God, are you sure? And by the way, God's always sure. You know, his right rate hovers right around 100%. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. God's always right. And God always knows what we need. And so I don't know what this series may mean to you, or what today may mean to you, but I've been processing as an individual and as a church, I think out of the season we just came from, for many people, spiritual commitment of obeying God got hard. And when it got hard, we were like, oh, I think now may not be the time. I better focus on me surviving, which then may be turned into apathy and disconnection. So that may not be true for you, but if that's true for you, you might want to Pull your ears forward and just listen and say, Holy Spirit, is this something you may be speaking to me today? And I know for me, we've been on a, what I would say a miraculous journey as a church in seven years. 
because of people trusting God and God doing, I believe we're in the middle of a miracle. I really do. And because of what God is doing, now we actually have a building that I don't have to pray every month and go, God will go wherever you want, but where is it? You know, like I was praying that for several years. Now we have a place that, that God can use to impact the lives of others. And, and now I want it to be something God would use, leverage the most, something God would use to help others find and follow Jesus. And I know so many of you are on that journey with us to want that as well. But I think now that we're on this side of having a building and starting to what we call putting lipstick on our pig, you know, like we're starting to renovate this beautiful facility, a gift from God, to be honest. Now's not the time to get comfortable. Now's not the time to find the seat that has my butt prints in it, right? That, where is it? That one's it. Now I fit right there. Now's not the time to go, man, we, we got here. We got a place. Let's kick up our feet and, 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 and make it about me. Why? Because there's work to be done. Because there's thousands of people that have a wrong view of who Jesus is. There's thousands of people don't care at all about who Jesus is. There's thousands of people that maybe want to connect with God, but have a lot of deluded things about what that looks like. There's thousands of people hurting and needing hope and help. And we have an assignment. And I've said this through the three weeks, and I'm gonna say it today, and you might just be, maybe you were traveling through, headed to the mountains, and you just happen to stop, and, uh, and you're on your way west. It, 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 you're never anywhere by accident. God is always strategic to speak to you in the season that you're in or the season that you'll find yourself in. And your season today may feel like I'm wandering around in a maze. And it would be great if a guide would help me take the right next step. So let's jump into the story. And I'm going to do my best today to kind of give an overview like a 30,000 foot view. And I, I just want you to put your creative cap on today and do the best you can to look at your own life, maybe from a 30,000 foot view and see it as where am I in the maze? And as I do, um, this, I, I don't want to cause confusion. I want to be as clear as I can. I want to bring clarity. So here's what I'm doing and here's what I'd ask you to do and everybody online to do. Would you ask this question? Jesus, where am I? on my faith journey. Jesus, where am I on my faith journey? Because I believe this story, looking at it from an elevated view, will give us an opportunity to take a spiritual assessment of where we are. So I was studying this, and I, and, and, and I had this idea. It's almost as if as you look at this story of God speaking to his people through Haggai, it's almost as if they're on a cycle don't raise your hand, but do you ever get on a cycle in life where things happen and you have a natural tendency to respond or react in a certain way? It's called a cycle. We all do, by the way. And you watch these people, and as you look at them from a distance, it's almost like you want to yell down and stop the cycle, right? Like, hey, this is coming because we see the whole, whole thing. You know, if you ever watch football on TV or you've gone to a game and you sit up in the stadiums, you're like, what's wrong with you? He was wide open. A little easier to see from an elevated view than when you're down on the field about to get crushed, isn't it? Yeah. So as we look at these people, what a great opportunity for us to do a spiritual checkup. So I think they have symptoms that are a result of their situations and God offers in a solution as the guide. And that's what we're going to look at today. So the first step that we're going to see is, is the symptom of mixed priorities and the solution, God says, put me first. So you see these people, the, the, their symptom because of their circumstance and their situation is they have mixed up priorities and then God's going to speak the solution and he's simply going to say, put me first. And verse three to five in Haggai chapter one, then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. And he said to them, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the house remains in ruin, while the house of the Lord remains in ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. For them, it would have been, hey, you should take a physical exam and give careful thought to your ways. For us, we can take a spiritual assessment and God would say, it is good. It's not bad. It's good to consider your ways. We all have a way about us. Is the way you're heading working? 
And that's what God, I think, is really wanting to get the attention of the hearts of his people. Now, having said that, his people, if you're here today and you're exploring the claims of Christ, you, you would say, you know, I've not gone all in and made Jesus the Lord of my life. It's one thing to believe in Jesus that he would save us from our sins. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm all about that because I need a savior to save me from my sins. My own, I don't keep my own standards. I need God to save me. But, but, but that's just a, a, a part of the pie. The whole pie is that we would also make him the Lord of our life, which means that he calls the shots, which means he's in charge. And so maybe you're here and you're considering, uh, maybe he saved me if Jesus is who he said he was, um, and I'm considering making him the Lord, putting him in charge of my life, but maybe you're just exploring. And today, glad you're here, because you're going to see some practical things that I believe would help you that you would consider. But for the rest of us that are followers of Jesus, these would not be options to consider. These would be commands to obey commands to obey from a heavenly father that loves it when we do a spiritual assessment because God wants us to be in it to win it he doesn't want us to be in it so that he would bless us he wants us to be in it because we love him and and so he says give careful thought to your ways and if you know in chapter one we talked about week one that he says to them man you guys have been working really hard putting in so much effort but getting so little out of it I don't know if there's anything more frustrating in life than to put a lot into something and get a little out of it. And some of us that have retirement plans, <laughs> you've seen it and you know what I'm talking about. I seem to be putting a lot in it and I don't seem to be getting much out of it. And so God's talking to this group of people that, that, that that's where they are. And so for us today, I'm, I'm going to, I think, hey, if this is week one for you, um, just hold on. I'm glad you're here. But for some of us to have been through the journey on the story, we've come to the place where I'm going to ask a challenging question uh, for us as Christians, as Americans. But I think you can handle it. Okay, so if you're new and you're hearing the story for the first time, maybe if something just to write down, think about, maybe think about later. But if you've been on the journey with us, are you ready? Because I'm asking this question to myself as well as I do a spiritual exam. The question is how Christian do I have to be And still hold on to comfort and convenience. Now, if we're honest, there's not a follower of Jesus that has not thought that thought. You may not said it out loud, but you've thought that thought. How Christian do I have to be and still hold on to comfort and convenience? Because the challenge for all followers of Jesus, but the challenge for American Christians is what is called conditional obedience. God, I, hey, God, I'll do this. I'll do this, but you do that. And I'll go this far, but God, if I go this far and you don't show up and do what I think you should do, I don't know if I want to keep going. It's conditional. I call it with my kids what's called selective listening. You know what I'm saying? I can be like, I can whisper, ice cream. And they be in that other side of the house. And there they are. I'm like, how'd you hear that? that you have like supernatural hearing. That's amazing. But I would say, kids, pick up your clothes. Kids, pick up your clothes. They don't hear nothing. They'd be right next to me. (laughs) What, Dad? Pick up your clothes. It's called selective listening. God to his people sometimes, they have selective listening. God's saying, I've made it clear on what I want you to obey. I just want you to take your next right step. Why? So that I can own you? God's already chosen you. Sometimes we work so hard to earn what he's already given us, his favor, his approval. And he chose us not based on what we did. He chose us because based on who he is. So he already chosen us. And so if we take it next right step, it's not so that he would bless us. It's because we love you, because you chose us first, and I choose you in return. And so we go on this journey. We have to ask ourselves, um, man, if you, and I've, I've heard people ask similar questions about, how Christian do I have to be and hold on to convenience and, and comfort? And here's what would be true with me and every follower of Jesus that's the wrong question. The question isn't, what, that's the question in the New Testament where the guy to Jesus says, hey, I've been a good person. 
Uh, do I also have to love my neighbor? What does it mean? How far, how, how far can I go up to the edge and still be Christian, but yet do what I want to do? And Jesus just bypasses the whole topic, goes right, drills down right to the heart, because Jesus wants your heart. He not only wants our obedience, but he first wants our heart. And so the solution God gives them is to a group of people who have mixed up priorities because it got hard. Now it's turned into apathy. He says it's simple. Just take your next right step. Put me first. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, if you want to connect with me relationally, then seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, so we look at this story, and we see that God's people, this group of people, man, they, they had mixed up priorities. And God says, hey, uh, by the way, it was, don't forget, it was 16 years 16 years where they had something clearly that God called them to do and then they did their own thing. And God, patient Heavenly Father says, now's the time. You said now's not the time, but I'm telling you now's the time for you to do what God's called you to do. And all you got to do is put me first. So they have mixed up priorities. We can see that. So what does that mean for us? What are our priorities? Is God first. You just need to know Jesus does not get excited if you say, Jesus, here's your second place red ribbon. He's not like, <laughs> why? Because he wants to be first. Because he knows not just for him, it's not like Jesus just has an ego problem. It's for you. He just knows that you'll sow and work with a whole lot of effort and not get very far when he's not first. But if you put him first, other things in life will fall into place. The second symptom is this, discouraged and then the solution God gives them is don't give up. So as we look at this story, you got this group of people, and they're discouraged. And we talked about that last week. They go, okay, we're going to get our priorities right, and we're going we're to work on the house of God. That was their priority of their next right. They said, we're going to build the house of the Lord, the temple. And they get started. They go a month, and then they're like, we can't do it. So they got excited. We can do it, and then we can't do it after a month. And we said that now this group of people, they're discouraged. Why? Um, because they got in, and they got a month in, and they realized it's not only hard, but then they compared. They compared their start to somebody else's finish, to the days of Solomon in his temple, and they got discouraged. And then they also got discouraged because they looked at their progress. And they were like, we've been going a month, and this is it. I thought I'd be a lot farther than this. And that causes discouragement. And God looks at their discouragement, and he basically says, not only don't give up, but hey, I'm with you. you got to be strong in the Lord. What does that mean? Not in your strength, but it's when you recognize your weakness and say, man, God, I need your strength to be most evident where I'm most weak. The beauty is, is that when God says that you're not working alone and I'm with you, the whole point is that you're not working alone. That God is with you. So God says, just keep doing what you're doing. Be faithful, be faithful, be faithful, and don't give up because God says, I'm with you to a discouraged heart. So you got this group of people that mixed up priorities. They get in, they go a month. We're looking at the maze. They go a month. Now they're discouraged because they've compared and they have a lack of progress. And then God says, don't give up. I'm with you. Be faithful. Keep going. They get back involved. They're like, all right. They start obeying. They start building again. They go a few months. And then they run into their next challenge. Is this cycle relating to anyone? Mixed up priorities, discouragement. Now, guess what they have is pride. And here's why. This is key. They get just a few months in. Now they're, now they're doing the work of God. Now they're taking steps. Now they're obeying. And now they get prideful. Why? Because they think it's their work that's making them holy. Verse 12. If someone carries consecrated meat... In the fold of their, and, and by the way, let me just give us a heads up. This is going to make no sense at all. What I'm about to read, you'll be like, what on earth does that mean? But I'm going to explain it, and it will hopefully make sense. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest, the priest answered no. So, so God has Haggai ask the priest some questions on purpose. Why is God having Haggai ask these priests the question? I'll tell you why. To expose their heart. He's doing a spiritual checkup. He wants to know what, what's the motive of your heart. Then he has, Haggai asked the priest another question. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. So, so what on earth is going on? Basically is this. God's saying, hey, Haggai, I want you to ask the priest these questions because what it's going to do is going to expose the motive of the heart of my people. 
And then the first question is this. They asked the priest. The priest would consecrate, make holy, set apart something of a sacrifice of meat to present it to God as worship. And so and they would wrap it up in their robes, and they would carry it from one place to the next. So he's asking, hey, priests, um, if that consecrated meat, that thing that's set apart, which makes it holy to be set apart, if it touches something else that's not been set apart, that's not holy, does that holy thing make the unholy thing holy? And the priests, they know their stuff, and they're like, no. Apparently, holiness is not contagious. Nope. They go, no, no, no. It, it, it won't make that thing holy that it touches. Okay. Ask the priest this question. So if an unclean thing touches a clean thing, if a, if a whole unholy thing touches a holy thing, um, does that make that holy thing unclean? And the priest, they're really smart, and they say, yes, it does. So apparently, holiness is not contagious, but sin is. So if sin touches something, it makes it unclean. So God is saying, here's the deal, and he, and he says it in verse 14. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they offer is defiled. Whoa. What's God saying to them? God's saying, listen, when your heart is not right, when you think the work you're doing is making you holy, that has made your heart unholy. Now all the work you're doing is unholy. When your heart is not right, everything you do is wrong. That's what God's saying to his people. Because your heart matters. God's not into transaction or religion. What God is into is saying, I want your heart and they think because of their work now on the temple, like holiness is rubbing off on them. If they just rub against the temple, now they're going, poof, lucky charm, they'll be holy. And God's like, you're missing the point. It's not your work that makes you holy. It's your God that makes you holy. And you're working for something to try to earn that God's clearly already given you. God already chose them. For all of us, as we do a spiritual exam, it is so easy to slip into the mindset that God will be more pleased with me because of my work for him. God is already pleased with you. God already chose you. God already loves you. God already sent his son to give his life for you. You don't have to continually try to earn something God graciously already gave you. But sometimes after following Jesus for a while and being obedient, we get prideful. And I will tell you, there is nothing stronger as a God repellent than pride. If you want to do something in your life that just makes God go, oh, man, I'm distancing myself from you. It's pride where, we, where you think it's your work that gets you close to God. Humility is where we say, oh, it ain't me, but God, I need you. And it's you, God. And in the New Testament, Jesus, it's your blood that makes me holy. Humility is an invitation for the Holy Spirit. You want God to come close to you, you just be humble. So you have this group of people with mixed up priorities. Then they go to the place of discouragement. <laughs> then to just be obedient for a few months, and then they get prideful. Now, you're probably more spiritual than me, but that is a story of Troy. Sometimes I get my priorities off. Sometimes I get to the place where I'm discouraged, and sometimes I get to the place where I'm like, oh, I'm prideful, because, God, you must love me more for how obedient I've been. So let's look at the next phase that the people go. The next one, the symptom is fear. And God's solution is this, you have nothing to fear. Fear and nothing to fear. And by the way, for the last thought, um, when it comes to holiness isn't contagious, you know the story in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus shows up? You know, so holiness isn't contagious, but sin is. You know the story of Jesus goes up to the leper, which is unclean. No holy person could touch the unclean person that wouldn't make the holy person unclean, but Jesus can. You know what's beautiful about that story is Jesus reaches out and he does love beyond reason and he touches the leper. And you know what? When people bump into Jesus who's holy, they become holy. Isn't that awesome? So he turned their whole system on its head because Jesus is the one that makes us holy. He touches the leper, the leper becomes holy. You know what happens to Jesus? Jesus is not unclean. He doesn't become sinful because he's that powerful. So the next one is fear and you have nothing to fear. Verse 21 Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal th thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. And on that day, talking about judgment day, because we'll all stand in front of Jesus. That's what is being proclaimed here. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, declares the Lord, and I will make 
you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. If there's anything on the journey of life that would keep God's people from doing what God wants them to to do and doing God's work of building his kingdom, it's fear. It's fear. Do you ever feel weak and insignificant in what seems to be a powerful world that surrounds you? I mean, think about this group of Israelites, 50,000, how how small and insignificant they are compared to Persia. Zerubbabel, here he is, should be the king because he's in the line of David, but he's only a governor because they're not ruling, Persia's ruling them. And you know when he thinks about that Persia could wipe them out in an instant, in a moment, and they're surrounded by this nation. Maybe, maybe we should just lay low. Maybe we shouldn't bother with the temple because we don't want to bring too much attention to this world that's very powerful because they can come and annihilate us. Don't you realize that Zerubbabel was terrified and thought of his weakness looking around of what seemed to be strong? You know what God is saying to Zerubbabel here? He's saying, man, things aren't nearly as strong as you think they are. He's saying these nations that seem so powerful that surround you, God was saying in an instant, I can turn them over because what is really strong is what is underneath. And when things get shaken, it reveals what's underneath. And God's saying, whether it's Babylonia or Persia or Rome or any power, what seems to be strong around you, though you feel weak and insignificant, what is underneath is what is really powerful and Zerubbabel. You've come from my line, and you might not be the end of it, of the one of the king of kings that will have the signet ring. The signet ring bears the authority and the approval from a king. Only a king has a signet ring. And he says, Rebable, a day is coming where there is a king coming that will shake it all, and things will be revealed for what they really are. And in the New Testament, Jesus says there are two houses. They look the same until it's shaken. And when it's shaken, that reveals what's underneath. And only one house will stand. And that's the house that's built on the rock. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this is a proclamation, a foreshadowing prophecy of Jesus being the King of kings who sits at the right hand of God right now wearing the signet ring. So what does that mean to them? So when you have fear, when you feel like, man, my faith is weak, and here I am surrounded by what seems to be a powerful world. If we have the King of kings the Lord of heaven's armies on our side who will shake all things and he'll be the only thing that is ever left standing for eternity and the things that are built on his foundation will be the only things that last for eternity. What do we have to be afraid of? That's what God is saying to this group of people. You have nothing to fear, Zerubbabel, because you're a part of what God is doing, that he is sending the King of kings and the Lord of of lords. I want to wrap up today just processing, well, what does that mean for me? We come back to the whole thought of, okay, if I'm to do a spiritual assessment through this story of a physical example, what does that mean for me? Maybe for you, your step would be, I need to get my priorities straight. I need to put Jesus first. Now, I like the thought of being a, a Christian and, and not going to hell, But as far as like my dreams and purposes and plans, I I don't know if God's first in that. You know what God would say to you as you do a spiritual checkup? Put me first. You don't have to have it all figured out. All you have to do is surrender. Make me the Lord of your life. Put me first. Some of us would say, you know what? I I tried that. You know, I, I went to church. I got in a small group, started serving, started trusting God with my finances. Didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? Didn't change my marriage. Didn't change my fine. I didn't get a promotion. I didn't get a car. Uh, It didn't work. And sometimes we try and we get discouraged because we think it's not working. And God would say, be faithful. Be faithful. Why? Because I'm with you. And when I'm with you, I will give you the strength to keep going, to be obedient to what I've called you to do. And then what you may not know is God is always doing something greater than just what you see. God's interested in not just the destination. He's interested in going on the journey with you. So he says, I'm with you. And then maybe you're at the place where you say, you know, um, if I'm honest, sometimes I think my obedience has made me holy. Sometimes I think God loves me more because of the work I'm doing for him. And that's what makes me holy. And God would say to you, if you recognize that, then just be humble. 
and say, God, you're, you're what makes me holy. I can't work my way to you. And here's what's beautiful. You don't expect me to. And God would tell you, I've already given you what you're searching for, my approval, my love. All you do is surrender to me. And then maybe you're here and you're like, dude, I'm, I don't know, maybe nobody else knows this, but if we're just doing a personal heart checkup, I'm a little afraid to do what God wants me to do. Looks like there's a big, strong, better world out there. That sometimes this faith thing of feeling insignificant and small. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says when it comes to building his kingdom, it starts off with the smallest of all garden plants, but it grows as we're obedient to become the largest in the garden. And not only having life, but giving life to other things. I love this verse. I'm going to close with this thought when it comes that we have nothing to be afraid of. Speaking when things are shaken, what really is true is revealed of what's underneath. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, when Jesus died on a cross, when he said, it is finished to telestai, it says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and check this out, and the earth shook and the rocks split. You know what was going on? Shaking. What seemed more powerful than death, hell, and the grave was actually being destroyed. Jesus on the cross, he looked weak, he looked vulnerable, he looked like he'd been defeated, but actually what is happening underneath, everything's being shaken. And death had no hold on him. <laughs> and the grave was destroyed. And sin, it was paid for. And if you ever wonder, God, are you with me? God would say, listen, you've got nothing to be afraid of. In fact, all that I've done, I've done to set you free so that you can serve me, so that you can be a part of building my kingdom, so that you can be a part of making a difference. And, and so I, I wanted to share um, something that's coming up that we're gonna do in like seven weeks. Okay, I'm just planting the seeds, so seven weeks. And this is something, as you say, Jesus, what's my step in the spiritual journey? This would be something that you would ask Jesus. Jesus, what would you have me do? And we're gonna do a special Christmas offering on December 11th. Before I talk about that, I, wanna, I want everyone here to know, Rock Hills, this, what we're doing, by the time we end the year, we're gonna do some, some stuff that's awesome. We're already committed to doing this. We're gonna do it no matter what. And, uh, and so we have At The Movies coming, of course. That's an opportunity for us just to connect with those that are unconnected. Um, we're going to be doing Turkey Draw for Thanksgiving, where we're going to bring hope and help uh, and, and helping those that need a, a help up in a time of need by, by just giving families who wouldn't have it otherwise some Thanksgiving dinners. We're going to do Christmas gifts for foster kids and students, which we've done for several years. But this, y'all, this year, y'all, we'll try and we're going to do our best to try to, to reach 300 foster kids and students with Christmas gifts. And uh, as we say amen, y'all going to be doing that, right? So, so. Uh, so it's going to be incredible. That's something we're going to be doing for sure. And then um, by the time we get to the end of the year, we're going to put an extra month payment on our building loan, which we think is just good stewardship. And so in January, I'm going to talk about the, the state of the church address kind of in January. So we're going to talk about where we were, where we are, where we're going. Excited to do that. But just know we've made it through our phase one renovation. And these are things we're going to keep doing to build his kingdom at the end of the year. But when we get to December 11th, we're, we're going to do something and we kind of just decided uh, we wanted to present it this way. We're going to do what we're calling a big, a big end year give. And, uh, and so we're doing a special offering. And uh, like I said, December 11th, so you got seven weeks just to pray about Jesus. Is this something you want me to do? First thing we're going to do is when we do all what I just said, we're going to get to the end year. And we're committed to do this. And, and so this will take partnership. We want to do what I'm going to call five for five. We want to give five local organizations uh, $1,000 each. So we're going to do five for five. And we're just going to give them a Christmas gift. They won't know it's coming. That's going to be fun. And, and then, y'all, you may not know this, but we, we uh, developed and, and, and added on some kid space. And it's full. 
And, and so we're estimating by the time we get to the spring and the spring semester, especially in our toddler area, where we're going to be out of space and we need another space. And, uh, and so we filled it already, which is awesome. And, uh, and so we estimate that a kid's space that we're going to need is going to be about 20000 5000 for the local partner gifts, and then our youth room. And so our youth has been meeting in the lobby and outside, but how many of you know winter's are coming, right? So, so outside ain't going to work very well. And we really need a youth space specific for them that's their room. And so that's something else we're going to be trying to do in the spring. And uh, we estimate the update a room uh, is probably going to be about 10,000. And uh, so we have a total of a, a big in year end gift of 35,000 that we can be a part of. And so that's going to come up on December 11th. And so we're going to do at the movie. So you may not hear about that much until we get on into December. And then we'll start talking about it again. But I wanted to plant the seed today. All right. And, uh, and so as we do here, here's what we do now these connection cards. And uh, I hope that you would write your step on it just to, just to share it, just to, as a symbol to say, God, this is a step I'm taking as a response to this series and this sermon. Um, but even if you don't write it on the card, I want to encourage everybody in here, do a spiritual assessment. Maybe, maybe God through his Holy Spirit mapped out a next step for you. Priorities, discouragement, pride, fear, things, symptoms we all have. But would you be open to say, God, I need your solution. And then you can mark that on the card. And, and so let's pray. Father, I love you. I just thank you for every person uh, in this room that's here today. And Lord, I thank you for this ancient story that, that I believe gives us a phys physical example of a group of people that were just responding honestly to the world around them. But God, it also gives us an example of, of what you speak as a loving Heavenly Father, to their people, to your people, and how you respond back to them. So, Lord, I don't know where each heart would be today as we kind of do a spiritual assessment off this story. But, Lord, I know this, that in the New Testament, we have all we need in Jesus. Jesus, you've accomplished it all for us. And we, when we put our faith in you, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you reside in us, God, you want us to join you in building your kingdom. We're a part of not just building a building. We're a part of building your kingdom, building your house, sharing the gospel, discipling other people, sharing our faith, trusting you with our finances, loving one another in community, serving God, making a difference as we serve you. All of that, God, you want us to do, not so that we are blessed. We do it because we love you. So, Lord, whatever our step would be today, I pray, I pray that you would give each person here an awareness of where we are on our spiritual journey. But I also pray that you would give us the boldness to take the step in obedience to what you're calling us to. And if you're here today and your step is to make Jesus the Lord of your life, man, I want to give you that opportunity. And as I've talked about, when you, when you just think about who Jesus is and you think about he chose you already. How did he choose you? He sent his son to die for you in hopes that you would respond, but he went ahead and died even if you wouldn't respond. But today is an opportunity for you if you've not yet made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life to invite him in, to put your faith in him and tell him, I give you my life. And if that's you, I want you to pray with me. And you would say in your own words, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son and Jesus, thank you for giving your life. And I put my faith in you. And Jesus, thank you for your precious blood that makes me holy because you poured out your blood so that I can receive forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, I pray that you'd make me whole and that you'd make me new and you'd help me to go on this journey of living for your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Rock